The book of Job, three boys or three fellas, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and their wisdom. Three rounds of telling Job why he is responsible because he's holding on to some secret sin. We're in round two. Hold on, Arvis. We're going to get to the end of the book here pretty soon. When God comes back and finally says, you know, Eliphaz and Bildad, so far, you guys are dead wrong, all right? But tonight, um, I'm going to slow down a little bit in chapter 19 because we're going to see that Job is going to describe something. Oh, well, let's just check it out. Round two, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and their wisdom. All three of Job's friends believe that Job is hiding sin. That's why God is punishing him. Do we know different? Absolutely. Job chapter 1, verse 8, Job um, had been atoning for his own sin and for the sins of his kids. So he was an altar kind of a fella. And God said that Job is, quote, blameless, upright, fears God, and shuns evil. So we know that to be true. Chapter 9, here goes Job continuing to respond to Mr. Bildad, who was particularly cruel last week. Chapter 19, verse 1. Then Job spoke again, How long will you torture me? How long will you try to crush me with your words, you guys? You have already insulted me ten times. You should be ashamed of treating me so badly. Verse 4. Even if I have sinned, that is my concern, not yours. You think that you're better than I am, using my humiliation as evidence of my sin. <clears throat> but it is God who has wronged me. Now, what we have here is an accurate portion of you guys have been jumping down my case. You're trying to convince me that I've done some secret sin. Hey, I've atoned for every sin that I can think of. That's not it. And then he says in verse 6, it's God who has wronged me. Now, um, Job, we're going to see him in heaven, and he's going to have a, a, a pretty interesting sort of turn of events starting, oh, in a little while. It's going to be a minute or so. we still got to go through round three. But right now, please notice what Job is saying. God has done me wrong. That is a very real sentiment of anyone who has lost something special. It's an interesting thing. Um, chapter 42, verse 7, God will tell Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar to their face, you are wrong, and Job is correct. And then God will also reveal to Job why he has let this huge challenge touch his life. In the meantime... Job knows it is God doing this, but he doesn't know why. Chapter 17, Bildad gave Job um, four illustrations, if you recall, of why Job was a crudhead and uh, why Job must be in sin. Now, check this out. Job is going to give, he's going to double that. He's going to give him eight illustrations. Now, if you would, mark these down as I give them to you. And I want you to keep a notice in something. I'm going to ask you when we get to the end of these eight if this sounds familiar. Okay? So number one, you captured me in a net. That's number one. Job feels like I'm an animal caught in a net. Number two, I cry out, help, help, but no one answers me. I protest but there is no justice. I don't have a lawyer with me. This is number two. I'm a prisoner and no one will listen. Now number three, verse eight. God has blocked my way so that I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. I am like a traveler, really a foreigner. I'm a foreigner in a land that I don't understand. That's what he's saying. So that's number three. And by inference, you are easy prey for muggers and robbers and easily uh, taken advantage of. Number four, verse nine. The Lord has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. Job, I'm like a king who was a big honcho once, but now dethroned and defamed humiliated, and nobody 
cares. Number five. Here's the fifth illustration. It's verse number 10. He has demolished me on every side. I'm finished. I'm like a collapsed building. Destroyed, worthless, injured perhaps, with no hope of repair. Now we're at number six. Six illustration. He, the Lord, has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. I am like an uprooted tree. Once useful, now I'm just firewood. Keep, keep thinking, keep focused here. Oh, and by the way, and there's a great big empty hole. <laughs> Now we're at number seven, illustration number seven, verse 11. And his fury burns against me, and he counts me as an enemy. And his troops advance, and they build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. I feel like I am an army or someone stuck inside a besieged city. I'm someone inside a besieged city. Now, in those days, wow, was that a terrifying experience. It really was. So, yay, we have these great big walls for our city, and then the enemy puts a, a, a siege wall around your wall. So they can't get in, maybe not right away. So you know what they do? They put a, a, a blockades, and they stop all the Walmart trucks from getting inside. And what was so scary was then that sieging army would just wait for you to starve. And if you didn't have enough food or water, what kind of a state would you be in knowing that as you get sicker and weaker still, at some point they're going to hit the doors of that wall and they're going to come flooding in and we're all going to get killed. Would that be a fearful, fearful existence for months upon months. Yep. And now we're at number eight. Illustration number eight, verse 13. My relatives stay far from me and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. In other words, I was kind of their authority, kind of their employee, and now they could care less about me. They got no respect at all for me, verse 16. And when I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. And my breath is repulsive to my wife, and I'm rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their back on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Parenthetically, so many colloquial terms come from your Bible. You ever heard that before? Man, by the skin of my teeth. By the way, is there skin on your teeth? Well, I guess if you don't brush enough, maybe there would be. But that's the point of it. It's, it. That's how thin it is, of course. What comes from here? I see the writing on the wall. All well, that is biblical stuff. But this last little section is very, very, perhaps the saddest of all. My friends and family, they're nowhere around. And in fact, they don't like me much anymore. What used to be family is not family anymore. And it's all scattered. I don't have the benefit of the strength or the support of my own family. So these last eight things, do any of this sort of ring a bell to you? This is an apt description of hell. Think with me on this one. Um, what he's basically saying there is, I'm caught, I'm trapped with no way out. Is that like hell? Uh, I'm a prisoner with no hope of justice. I cry out and nobody cares. A stranger in a bizarre and scary place, wide open for violence and injury. Maybe one time I was a big deal, but not now. Maybe once I was indispensable and respected and even loved, not now. 
No one even remembers and no one cares. I am physically destroyed, broken, collapsed, not able to rise. I'm a dead tree. I have no fruit, no life, and I am firewood. I am besieged by violent entities, fearful all the time, starving, thirsty, wounded. Worst of all, any family I once had is either in heaven and not with me, or they are in the same besieged, separated, violated, injured, in prison state as I am. Job is going through a hugely difficult time. And he has described eight powerful sort of adjectives or illustrations. We know that Job is going to endure this and God is going to restore him double all of this, all that he lost. He is going to get out. How awful would it be for Job to have to stay in this state forever? I'm going to do a quick little Bible study. And the reason this is not particularly fun to go over or for you to listen to, but especially you intercessory prayer people, this next little description of what the Bible describes as hell, people have little understanding. Most people believe that hell, well, you know, at least the interesting people will be there. I don't know, is there a notion that they're going to be sitting around uh, talking and playing cards? I don't know. Please remember that hell is so awful because nothing that God is, is there. So, you know, if you, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from your heavenly father of lights, book of James. If it's good, it's because it's God. And people who think that they want to live their life without God, they miss that. They don't understand it. And in hell, it is an eternity. And none of God's attributes will be there. Let me give you a couple quick little examples. In hell, there is no escape and there is no hope. Um, this will be on the, the um, I almost said tape. Nobody has tape anymore. But it'll be on if you want to go over these. Uh, here's some Bible addresses. There's a popular notion of what people think hell is, and that conception is so not correct. For instance, there is no escape and there is no more hope. Isaiah 24, verse 22. They are gathered together as prisoners in the pit and shall be closed up in prison. Proverbs 7, verse 27. Chambers... Of death. Job 17, 16, bars of the pit. There is no physical strength. There's no sense of vitality and life. Um, it gets a little, you don't see it as much the more birthdays you have, but you see a sense of it no matter what your age is. When you get up in the morning and the sun is shining in, the birds are chirping, and you got the perfect cup of coffee. And you walk out in your backyard and you breathe in, whoo, do you sense that vitality and life flowing through you? Or walking down your favorite trail. That whole sense of renewal and invigoration was invented by God. That will not be in hell. Did you know that Isaiah 14 verses 9 through 10 says this? Hell from beneath is moved to meet you at your coming. Talking about an evil fella. They will say, you are become weak as we are. And that little story there in Isaiah chapter 14, that's a big honcho here on earth. And the moment that his disembodied spirit descends into Sheol, a shout comes up from the other disembodied spirits who died outside of God. You are become as weak as we are. Wow. Psalm 88 verse 4. Those who go down to the pit, a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more. Um, every Academy Award season, I love to watch the Academy Awards, by the way, Nicole and I do, 
But uh, and I'm, I've mentioned it before, but you know, when they're coming down the red carpet and they, they're dripping with diamonds and, and um, outfits that cost tens of thousands of dollars and hair perfect, we're shoveling our popcorn. We're going, man, is that a, is that a good looking human or what, you know? And boy, are they famous, you know. And, and several, or oh, a couple years ago, I showed you some pictures from, the, some, from, from some old um, Academy Award um, dinners and banquets. It used to be kind of a different sort of flow. But then I got a, the best picture I could, and I showed it on the screen. I said, all right, everybody, what was it from 1912 or 19-teen something? Go ahead and show me all the famous people there. And of course, all those years ago, we don't know who those people are. But for that time, they were the cat's pajamas. I don't know where I came up with that one. And in the last Academy Awards, there it was. There's all the beautiful people. Or when you hear of someone who's a billionaire who passes away, or some important person, a star athlete perhaps, who... who um, forged many championships for that city and that team. Several times, thinking of one, nine championship rings. Ooh, and that is pretty impressive. But if he didn't know the Lord, the moment he closed his eyes on this side, he opened his eyes and he heard, hell from beneath is moved to meet you at your coming, and they will say, you are as weak as we. Nobody cares. And Job has touched on this. Hmm. Acts 17, verse 28, in him, Jesus, we live and move and have our being. Any sense of vitality and newness, that's from him. Oh, by the way, in the new Jerusalem, uh, if you will, heaven and eternity beyond, some people have noted, well, what are we going to do there? And, and on this under the sun perception, we think, well, we're just going to fellowship with each other and with God, and we eat of the tree of, the, we eat of, the tree of life, and, and, and we, never, we never die. Well, what, that sounds boring. And they don't understand what true fellowship and true love and true family and purpose actually feels like. Oh, and by the way, there is constant renewal. Let me try to phrase it in another sort of uh, way. The billionth eon that you are with Jesus and with your family will be as new and invigorating as it was the first moment you arrived. That's amazing, isn't it? Do you understand why hell will be exactly the opposite? Because that sense of newness is God. It won't be there. And this is the thing that really gets me. Did you know that there will be no rest in hell? Remember, those people that do go to hell in that separation, the lake of fire or outer darkness, they get a brand new body, remember. They get a resurrected body too. It has a physiological component to it that can, if we look at Jesus' resurrected body, it can eat and enjoy food, which means if it doesn't eat, will there be a sense of lack, even hunger? I don't know, can't say. Um, I believe that there is experiencing thirst and everything a physiological body, but it is somehow changed. Remember, in our new bodies, at the resurrection, pardon me, at the rapture, we go up with the Lord and we meet him where? At Denny's for a Grand Slam breakfast. We meet him in the air, remember? And then where do we go after that? We are with the Lord Jesus at the marriage feast of the Lamb and that new body, that raptured new body, like Jesus' body, can live and exist and experience the multidimensional place where God and the angels live. How awesome will that be? Senses will be hugely enhanced. Our, ex our understanding will be exponentially expanded. The new bodies in hell will also be hypersensitive too, but not 
to take in all the brilliant light that is indescribable to both Ezekiel and John the Revelator and anyone who saw Isaiah, anyone who saw heaven. Those eyes designed to take in the brilliance and the fire hose of love and family will have nothing but darkness. And it gets worse. There's no sleep. Revelation 14, 11, Smoke from their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. This one hits me particularly hard the older I get. And we talked about it on Tuesday night. Um, um, there's a lot of things I really enjoy, but one of my favorite things to do is to pull the covers up to my chin at night in my warm bed. I bolt the door with the reasonable expectation no one is going to break it down and that there are amazing men and women guarding our safety while we sleep. There's probably not going to be an invasion by the Russians or ISIS or any of that. I have the reasonable expectation that I can rest peacefully all night. And then I wake up birds chirping Ah, and I grab that cup of coffee and stand in the backyard. Life is good, you know. In hell, there is no rest ever. We're going to see here in a minute that uh, there's like a besieged thing going on. There are demons after, because they're taking, those fallen angels are taking out their frustration on the resurrected humans. Isaiah 15, 20, the wicked are like a troubled sea. They cannot rest. Psalm 127, verse 2, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. In hell, they are not God's beloved. Also, there is feeling senses in hell. But most of what they will be feeling will be separation, regret. Because they're going to be able to remember Every time they refuse God's knocking on their heart. Mm. Zechariah 9 verse 11. Prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. Luke 16. Father Abraham, have Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. All this pain without any release of death. Did you know that the book of Revelation is, is horrific by the judgments, but that's not because God is just really mad and like anybody storming around the place, kicking chairs about. Here's what the book of Revelation really is and why it is so horrific. It is God removing his protective hedge and allowing the people on earth who refused his salvation, who refused his work for them, to give them exactly what they want, a system where he's nowhere around. Well, what does that system do when God takes his hand away from it? It, it uh, devolves into horrific pain and exploitation. Revelation 9, verse 6. Did you know that that is a peculiar judgment in that humans try to kill themselves and they can't do it? All this horrific pain, you have stinging, um, um, probably demons that are messing with it. And you take that little snapshot right there. And you see that for five months, demons are on the surface of the earth going after the humans, stinging them, injuring them. And people, and there's sulfur and there's darkness. And they're like, I can't take it anymore. Blam. And then squish, squish, squish. They can't feel the top of their head, but they aren't dead. The release of death is withheld from them. That is God saying, are you sure you want this over me? And what do most of them say? No, we don't want you. Rocks fall on us. In those days, Revelation 9, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. There's darkness. Lamentations 3 verse 6. He has set me in a dark place uh, that, they, that they that are dead 
Jude 13, blackness and darkness forever. Exodus 10, verse 21, darkness that can be felt. He let the Egyptians taste that a little bit. You have hearing, but mostly it's the wailing of gnashing of teeth, your own and the countless others sharing the same torment. And there is the incessant, continual, thundering, wailing every minute of every hour. Isaiah 15, verse 21, there is no peace with the wicked. And then remember how um, Job said, I feel like I'm in a besieged city. So is hell. You're surrounded by hatred. Psalm 103, verse 17, the mercy of the Lord is upon those who fear him. So that means if God's not there, there is no mercy at all in hell. Revelation 13, verse 6, Then he, the Antichrist, opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, God's name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That's him cursing you. And when he gets to the lake of fire, you think he's going to stop? James 2, verse 7, Do they, the unrighteous, not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? You think they'll stop either? And then there's no famous people, no big shots, no purpose, no future, except more torment. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, there is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It doesn't matter what you did. No matter how many trophies and Super Bowl this and NBA champions that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you end up in hell, nobody cares. Ecclesiastes 6, 4, your name, the dead, is covered in darkness. They don't even remember your name. Psalm 88, verse 12, shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Rhetorical question, no. Or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? No. Shall your wonders or your deeds be known in the dark? No, nobody cares. And your religious work in the land of those forgotten? No. Isaiah 26, verse 14. They, the big shots on earth, they are dead. They will not live. They are deceased. They will not rise. Isn't that what Job said? I'm like a collapsed building that cannot rise. Therefore you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. And finally, Jeremiah 20, verse 11, they, the big shots on earth, will be greatly ashamed for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. Please notice that in the book of Job, the eight illustrations of a hellish experience for a time for Job. One of the reasons why God allowed Job to go through that was he knew that Job wouldn't fold. He knew that. And also, this is going to be an experience so deeply felt with a man of letters, Job himself. He's going to write it down. And now here we are reading it all these years, millennia later, and this is perhaps one of the most startling um, ex explanations of hell. One more time. Um, Job noticed that hell, I'm caught and trapped with no way out. I'm a prisoner with no hope, no justice. I'm crying out, help, help. No one cares. I'm like a stranger, a bizarre stranger, a stranger in a bizarre and scary place, wide open for violence and injury. And once maybe a big deal, now no longer. I'm not loved, and no one remembers, and no one cares. I am physically broken down and collapsed, unable to rise. I'm a dead tree. I am firewood. I am besieged by violent entities, fearful all the time, potentially starving and thirsty, wounded, and no hope. This is difficult to talk about, but is it a real place? Ooh, how could God of love, how could a God of love make such a place? Please understand, the only thing God made 
was a platform of sorts. It is so horrific because of the fallen angels and the humans who hate God and all of his attributes, then they go nuts on each other for all eternity. Whoo, not easy to talk about. But when you're thinking of someone that God perhaps brings to your mind, they probably wouldn't sit still for a teaching like this. They're like, well, that's what you think about your Bible. But if the Bible is right about Palm Sunday, was Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives exactly like Daniel said? If God knows the future, if there's a nation of Israel on the planet, and if it was right about that, why wouldn't God's word be right about this? Oh, you intercessors, keep interceding and praying and fasting for those that are lost in your life. Amen. And worst of all, any family that I once had is either in heaven, they're not here now, or in the same besieged, separated, violated, injured, imprisoned state as I am. Job 19 is a model of heaven. All right, verse 21. What do you say we move out of hell and we move on to a more pleasant subject? Verse 21. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me. Job's friends, his counselors, huh, you think that they're more interested in being right than they are being fruit? I think so. Um, if you were with us uh, last week, man was billed that rough on Job. He was actually taunting him for losing his children. Hmm. Job's friends, his counselors, are more interested in being right than about being fruit. Please don't forget this. No matter what that person has done to you or done to someone you love, please harvest. May we always be fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. By the way, the fruit of the Spirit is not something that you can work up and grunt into existence. The fruit of the Spirit is kind of a dipstick. How much oil has you got in your engine? Well, that dipstick should tell you. How much Spirit of God is in that Christian? How much fruit do they have? Verse 22, must you also persecute persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when God does remove some of that constant protection and provision, and whenever we feel the pinch of a significant trial, we seem to put God on trial. You ever notice that? Someone loses a child. That is rough, rough, rough. A business that you poured your heart and soul into. A marriage. Maybe even your health. The first thing that seems to occur to us is what? What are you doing? God. Why God? And behind that, we may not say it out loud, is this sentiment. Lord, i got to be straight with you. Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, usually when we say good people, who are we thinking about? Me. Um, by the way, who of us are truly good? What does the Bible say? There is none righteous. Hold your finger here. Let me show you something that you're not going to like. You're not going to like it. Um, it is in Romans 3. I sure hope memory serves. I want to show you something. Uh, Michael and I had a good chuckle about this a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it's Romans chapter 3. I want, to, I want you to see something. Romans chapter 3, everybody. This is, uh, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul writing. Is Paul going to get a good grade in his report card? Yes. If anybody tried to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, it was this guy. Now watch what he says. In Romans 3, look at verse 10. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none who understands. Nobody really gets it. There is none who seeks after God. What? And we're quick to say, well, well, I do. Please understand, any of us that truly seek after the Lord are doing so because he went first. He was knocking on the door of my heart. If it was not for the Lord, his conviction went before I was saved around me, his beautiful conviction in me as I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Do you know that this is the true state of every human who is disconnected from the well of God's love? One more time. There is none righteous, no, not one. Well, what about Mother Teresa? She was probably pretty good, but was she this good? There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have, gone, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Paul is saying, don't, don't blame me. He's actually quoting Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. He's going to put another one together. He's now going to cite Psalm 5. And Steve's throat is an open tomb. Well, if he doesn't brush his teeth, it sure smells like that. You know what? Well, I'm, well, you're all talking to, Steve, you're talking to us right now only by the inspiration and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Anything good ever comes out of this coconut right here. Who did it? Was it me or was it him? Steve's throat is an open tomb and his tongue practices deceit. The poison of asps is under his lips. That's Psalm 140, verse 3. Steve's mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Psalm 10, verse 7. Well, yeah, when the Raiders are playing, of course. And Steve's feet is swift to shed blood. Now, you just see me on Sundays and Wednesdays, and, you know, I hope I'm not doing this as a rule, but have I ever felt in my heart so-and-so is a great big fat creep. Have I ever thought it? You bet I have. Has it ever slipped out of my mouth? Yes. Now hopefully and prayerfully the Lord will convict me each and every time. But do you see what is true of all of us? And Steve's feet is swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery is in Steve's way. Oh, if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ. And being saved, born again, prayerfully, spirit-filled, that is who I am. Oh, and we're not done. And the way of peace, Steve does not know. True story. Until the Prince of Peace is given full reign. There is no fear of God in Steve's eyes. Psalm 36, verse 1. Back to our book of Job. Oh, how many of you like that particular assessment of the typical human person? That's why the notion of why do bad things happen to good people is the wrong question. The correct biblical question truly is why in the world would a holy God bless any of us who are all those things that Romans 3 just said. Does that make sense? A lot of bad things happen to good people. And usually the good person we have in mind is me. How could you let this happen? When challenges happen, and Job is right in the middle of it, please notice that most people, the first person they blame, how could? Please don't forget. Let's think about that God for a minute. Does God know that all those conditions of the human heart are there? Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He zips up a human suit. Full well knowing that here's going to come a lifelong of jeering. Even from his own brothers, remember. Psalm 69. 
And remember how they were chiding him on that, hey, Jesus, Mr. Messiah, man. Ah, <laughs> you know, you should go to Jerusalem. Mm. Finally, of course, they beat the stew out of him, lashed his back to ribbons of flesh, nailed him to a cross, stuck a spear in his side. Why did he do that? Because he loves us. Why do bad things happen to good people is not a correct understanding of the true human experience. The real question is, why would a holy God bless such a sinful wretch like me? And what's the answer? Because he loves us. This is kind of what Job is talking about. Truth, why does a holy God allow any good thing to any of us who have billions of sin. If my, but I'm a good person, defense went into heavenly court. I, I stole this from John Corson. All God would have to do was bring the cross examination to prove God's case. Romans 3, verse 23. All, everybody say all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, and the wages of sin is death. We earned it. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Romans 5, verse 8, why we were yet sinners. That's when Jesus died for me. Everyone going through a trial or a great challenge has got to know this. And that's why the book of Job is so very, very important. It has been allowed by the Lord who so loved us that he put on a human suit. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Hold on to a tight harvest. For I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Mm. Amen. Verse 23. Let's scoot to the end. Oh, that my words could be recorded, says Job. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel and filed with lead, engraved forever on the rock. By the way, are we reading Job's words now? Yes. And how many gravestones over the years, chiseled in stone, have borne some of the sayings, especially as we're going to see here in a minute, um, I know my Redeemer lives and I will walk with him on this earth. Hey, it was chiseled in stone. And by the way, right in your margin here, Matthew 12, verse 36. Did you know that all of our words are recorded? All of them, Matthew 12, verse 36 Every idle word men speak. You know what the idle words are, right? That's when nobody's looking. Uh, that's when you think that there's nobody around. When someone stands behind a podium and can gather his thoughts and read his prompter. Well, there's a polished person giving us his words. You want to know who this person really is? Wait till nobody's looking and let somebody cut them off on the freeway or smash their thumb with a hammer. That word that comes out right there is the unguarded word. That's what this word means, idle, unguarded. That's what's really going on in your heart. And by the way, when the Lord allows a knucklehead to cut you off from the freeway and you're all, that comes out of your mouth, um, that's not the Lord saying, ooh, you know, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. I think that's the Lord saying, Steve, I think the spirit gas tank is a little low. <clears throat> no, I, I'm teaching a Bible study tonight, Lord. I'm totally in the spirit. Hey, you big beep, 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 jerk. That's an idle word. That's an unguarded word. That's what the bucket went into the well and pulled out and spilled all over the dashboard. Does that, does that make sense? So when you do hit that hammer or the dog does something on the carpet or whatever it might be, and that word that comes out, don't be ground powder about it, but that's the Lord saying, I just got to let you know that's kind of where you're at right now. Every idle word that men speak, they shall give an account in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified 
What are the only justified words that is entrance to eternity with the Lord? Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin and write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Or by the words you sh- by your words you shall be condemned. What are those words? No, Lord. Verse 25, but as for me, I know my Redeemer lives. How many of you sang that one a couple times in your life? Remember chapter 14, uh, in the midst of terrible stress, when does Job's faith arise then? When he talks about after the grave, living again. When is Job's faith strengthened? When is Steve's faith strengthened? When is Steve's tattered hope restored? When Steve remembers the reality of eternity. For I know my Redeemer lives. You remember that one? Comes from Job. Right after Jesus told his disciples that he was about to die, what did he do for those hopeless and heavy hearts? He said, let not your heart be troubled, boys, because in my Father's what? House are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. It was a methodology of the Lord himself. I know this is rough news, but keep your eyes on heaven. At another low, low point, Job remembers about heaven and focuses on that. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body is decayed, though my, what is it? Though my flesh be destroyed, though my flesh be something, with my eyes I will see God, for I know, I won't burden you with that one. Dan could belt it out on pitch and in key, but I won't be able to do that. This is where it comes from. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body, body, resurrection, I will see God. Is Job right? He sure is. Verse 27, I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Resurrection, harvest. Resurrection. Notice as Job's trial deepens, so does Job's revelation. One more time. I don't want you to miss that one. Please notice. He's just talked about revelation. Notice. As Job's trial deepens, so does Job's revelation. That's the purpose of God allowing tests and trials. Finally, verse 28 and 29. How dare you guys go on persecuting me saying it's your own fault. You should fear punishment yourselves, for your attitude deserves punishment, that you will know that there is indeed a judgment. And don't forget, God says to them exactly that face to face. Um, Eliphaz, um, Bildad, and Zophar, you guys are dead wrong. You better get off that train. Likely Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar categorized success, probably because, well, how prosperous are you? How um, non-trials is your life? That is what's true. That, that means because God is blessing you because he has to. Jesus' definition of success is when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen, you guys. Whew. How many of you had no idea that Job is going to describe hell in his book. Well, he was certainly going through it. Let's all stand. I want to read something. Go ahead and turn our lights down a little bit if you would, Chris. I'm going to read this to you. This is from John Corson. He has a way of seeing things, doesn't he? How did, and you've heard me say before, do you know much about where he's been and how and what he has been through? Yeah, how does he kind of get all that stuff like that? How does he get that application? I read the same verse, didn't catch a thing. John Corson has been through some stuff. Here's what he says. When Job was at the bottom, 
He started thinking about eternity in a way that perhaps he never would have if everything had remained comfortable. I'm convinced that prosperity is a far greater problem for us than persecution. Because when we're prosperous, we tend not to think about eternity or heaven. We start living for this life. And those pastors who are trying to teach people, live your best life now? What do you think Job would think of that? Continuing, John says, So in his goodness, the Lord says to us, in order to get you thinking about heaven, where you're going to spend the next gazillion years, I will send challenges and trials and difficulties your way to get your focus off of the football game, off of the shrubs in your backyard, off of your job, off of your car. When you're at the bottom, the only place you can look is up. Tensions in relationships, setbacks in business, debilitating illnesses all make us long for heaven. That's why the Lord allows them to come into our lives. Without them, we would be too rooted in a world that is passing away. And God loves us too much for that. Amen. Lord, I want to thank you for brothers like John Corson and brothers like Job. And Lord, these are not pleasant verses to go over and teach. And perhaps that's why few people do. But Lord, I know that this clay pot, this stubborn, stiff-necked shepherd, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, that through this difficult season in our personal lives, both Nicole and our personal lives, and the challenges coming against this church and this church family, Lord, thank you that there was a guy like Job who didn't fold. He got through. And as his trials deepened, so did his revelation. Lord, we need revelation. These are the very last days. And I pray, Father, that when you show up here, will you find faith on the earth? Will you find faith in operation in Washoe County? Will you find faith and faithfulness at harvest when you arrive. I pray you do, Lord. Until that day, Lord, would you be the lifter of every head in this room. And Lord, would you cover this church and this family with your strength and your protection. In Jesus' precious name and everybody said, Amen. Amen.